morning and happy Lord's Day to you, Westside Baptist Church. I just wanted to uh, do something a little different and, uh, and pre-record. That way I can uh, uh, post uh, the, uh, the uh, passage that we're going to be looking at and also you can uh, follow along with me in, in notes. I know some of you guys like to uh, take notes. Um, and, uh, and this allows me to be able to uh, make the video a little bit better before it's posted. So anyway, but you can still uh, interact. Uh, feel free on, if you're on Facebook watching this, then, uh, then I know we've got most of our church family that watches on Facebook. We've got a handful that don't have Facebook accounts and they want to watch as well. So I've decided to pre-record uh, for their benefit. But if you're watching on Facebook, uh, you can actually comment on this uh, while the video is going and everybody else can say hey to each other and that sort of thing still feel like we're interacting um, and uh, But I'm not of course going to be able to interact with your comments because I'm looking at uh, a little black dot on the camera right now, so uh, This is very uh, different as I always say with this COVID-19 thing preaching to a black dot um, and not preaching to people uh, but that's just the situation that we're in right now and uh, I pray that your family is doing well. Uh, I've talked to many of the church folks. Seems like everybody's just kind of in the same boat. We're all just uh, uh, kind of waiting for life to return to normal and uh, just seeking God's uh, mercy on us as a nation. Um, so I did want to give you an update about something, and that is I've talked with the deacons uh, about the uh, Governor Kemp's recent comments, and uh, he's made some comments uh, about opening several things up but then he's also said he recommends churches uh, not open until at least mid-may and uh, he actually uh, said that they can open if they would like to but he recommends waiting a few more weeks uh, after much prayer and uh, conversation about it i've kind of come to the conviction that um, this thing isn't really slowing down and uh, even though people are out and about even though lowe's is packed out people are doing life as normal it seems like I just kind of feel like it's probably safe for us as a church family not to gather in whole until uh, the first week in June. I know that may be sounding a long way off, uh, but we have to remember this is the first time this has ever happened for any of us in our generation. And uh, so I think we just have to take precautions. Um, we have a lot of elderly in our church and, um, and they just, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that it's probably best for us uh, to wait out a little bit longer until we see those numbers drop. Uh, significantly before we uh, become that church that is known for having opened up and then people got sick and you know how that goes so uh, we don't want to be known for that um, and so we just uh, we know that this is this is a strain on you guys it's very different very awkward for me and for you guys as well uh, but as your pastor I just want to let you know I really appreciate you and I want to do everything in my power to just uh, be an encouragement to you guys at this time if there is absolutely anything you need, if there is a prayer request, if, if there is something that you need at the store, uh, please uh, write underneath this video or send me a, uh, a personal a message or text message or call. Let me know how I can uh, serve you guys at this time. been praying for you all. Love you guys and can't wait to be able to get back to uh, gathering as a church family. Um, but I do want to invite you to turn with me in God's Word to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. And we are going to be in chapter 39 of Psalms, Psalm chapter 39, and uh, we finished up the Roman study, and I thought it would be good for us to begin a series uh, looking at uh, the Psalms, and as I've been praying about this for months and kind of planned this thing out, I uh, didn't realize that um, COVID-19 was going to hit us, and uh, so, but as I was looking at this series, I thought to myself, hey, you know what? There is one phrase that we find throughout the book of Psalms that I think would be good for us to highlight. And uh, we're going to take a look at several different Psalms for the next several weeks and uh, just see what God has for us from that. So um, it seems at this season that God has pushed the pause button on many of us on our lives. Now, I know people are back at work. Um, things are returning to somewhat normal. And yet, Things aren't really normal. Uh, if you are out and about, you see people wearing masks. Um, you see people, uh, you know, you see uh, in the grocery stores, they have uh, marked out on the uh, ground, stand six feet apart and walk one way this aisle and one way that aisle. Uh, so things are very odd and very different. And uh, we know that there is uh, rampant sickness and there's probably going to be a peak 
Uh, this is going to happen in, uh, in the next coming days and weeks uh, for this virus. And so that being said, um, God seems to have pushed the pause button on our lives. Uh, social gatherings are, are eliminated at this point, and that means churches as well. And uh, so in light of the fact that God seems to have pushed the pause button, I think it'd be good for us to consider uh, what it means for us to pause and to reflect on God's Word. And the one word that I mentioned that is found throughout the book of Psalms is the word Selah. And the word Selah appears 74 times in our Bible. 71 of those times is in the book of Psalms. So obviously Psalms is very big on this term. Uh, and the word Selah, it's a musical term that means pause. And it actually is a word that means a pause and reflect on what was just spoken. And so oftentimes in the Psalms, we're going to be able to see this where, um, uh, where David or the psalmist will say something, make some comment, and then he'll say, say la. That means stop and reflect and seek to apply what was just mentioned. And so what better time during uh, then, then this COVID-19 crisis than to pause and to reflect on what God has said in his word. And so the very first one we're going to take a look at in Psalm chapter 39 is that we ought to pause and reflect on the shortness of life and the frailty of mankind. The shortness of life and the frailty or uh, weakness of mankind. I'm just going to read it for us. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open to Psalm chapter 39. It says there, and this is a Psalm of David. This is to the choir master, to Jedithon. It says, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me as I mused the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, O Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Selah. Surely man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather and now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me, that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. I want to invite you to turn, or, uh, turn your hearts with me to prayer. Father God, thank you for your word. We pray, God, that you would uh, break open the bread of life to us this morning. God, that you would help us Lord, to examine our own lives and to be able to realize in the midst of this pandemic, God, that we are so frail, and Lord, you are eternal. Lord, help that to teach us what we need to. Lord, help us, God, not only to listen to this message and, uh, and then not to apply it, but God, to listen to this message so that we might seek to live in light of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So Psalm chapter 39 is all about that call to pause and reflect on just how short our life is and just how frail we are as humans. If there's one thing this crisis should teach us, it is that lesson that we are not meant to be here very long and that we are so incredibly frail as humans. Well, we're not sure about the context of this. We know that David was often running from King Saul, who was wanting to murder him. You see that all throughout uh, the kings, and uh, or all throughout uh, uh, First and Second Samuel. Uh, but we do know that David was in some sort of very difficult affliction, and we find ourselves in one as well. 
And so we can sympathize with that. As a matter of fact, this is a time probably more than any to, uh, to read the book of Psalms, to pray the Psalms back to God, because they are so full of the emotional life of uh, God's people as they go through suffering, as they go through affliction and hardship and tribulation. Well, this psalm is divided into three. First off, David's tongue troubles. Secondly, we see in verses, well, that was verses one through three. And then secondly, in verses four through six, we see David's life lesson. And then lastly, in verses seven through 13, we see David's prayer, David's prayer. Um, and what we learn from David here as he's praying this psalm back to God, and, and this is, of course, written down, if you didn't know, for, uh, uh, for music. That's why the term Selah is a musical term. It says in the very beginning, this is to the choir master. And, and, um, and we don't know who Jedithan is, but we do know that, um, uh, that uh, the Levites were, were directed to sing these praises to God and uh, lead the people in, uh, in singing. Um, and so even as David's praying, this is written down for the generations to come so that they might be encouraged so that they might sing praises to God as well. But what this song teaches us is how to glorify God in the midst of affliction. How to glorify God in the midst of affliction. And I see very, I see three uh, very important truths for us as God's people as we take a look at this passage. First off, if we wish to glorify God in the midst of affliction, then you've got to guard your tongue. Guard your tongue. You see there in the first three verses, uh, that David is making a vow. David says, Lord, go, I want to guard my ways. I don't want to sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle. Well, what are we guarding our tongue from? Well, apparently, David was guarding his tongue from saying something that might uh, lead people in his presence to the conviction that perhaps God is not good. Uh, perhaps God doesn't know what's going on. Man, I was just reading this and I was convicted myself because, you know, if there is a time where we can, our, our tongues can get us into trouble, uh, now is the time. When you're in the midst of some strange affliction or some weird tribulation like this, like COVID-19, uh, then it's so easy for us to complain to other people and not realize that we're actually complaining to them about God. You see, every time I moan and I complain, my wife and kids can testify to that, that that is something that is uh, just a problem for me as well as you, I'm sure. Then what I'm actually doing is I'm actually telling those around me, God doesn't really love me. God is not really good because if God were good, then he would make my life easier than he does. And I was convicted about this as, you know, we're, we've, uh, I don't know how many weeks we are into this thing, five, six, seven weeks into this thing. And, uh, and it looks like we're still going to be in it for a little while longer. And uh, I'm kind of starting to get to that point, you know, where, where you uh, haven't had exercise in a little while and, and you're really wanting to get out and do things, but you can't. And you just feel pent up, you know. And, uh, and so, therefore, there starts coming out uh, sort of, you know, self-pity, sort of, uh, poor me, I'm not able to do this, I'm not able to do that, I can't wait till this is, gets over. And really what I'm saying, what we're saying when we do that is, uh, well, God isn't really good in this moment. This affliction right now, didn't come from or through his hands. Uh, this is something that he is not graciously uh, controlling for my life. And so we have to be careful when we guard our tongue. What I'm saying is we have to uh, guard it against speaking too harshly of God's good providences. Notice that word uh, good. This is God's good providence. This COVID-19 crisis is part of God's perfect an all-wise and sovereign plan for the good of his people and for the glory of his name. What does that word providence mean? I like what Phil Johnson, uh, how Phil Johnson described it. He says, it is God's continuous involvement with his creation whereby he preserves and governs all his creatures in accord with his perfect will. He sovereignly orders everything he has made to accomplish everything he intends for his own glory. I like that. The only thing I would add to that is that he doesn't just act for his own glory. He acts for the good of his children. Every single thing that will ever happen to us as God's children is for our good. And God is a loving father. And so he, uh, 
He is sovereignly orchestrating all of this stuff. This does not catch him off guard up in heaven. He's not surprised to see this. Um, these aren't random events that just uh, happened because some virus got let loose. No, no, no. God was actually guiding and working this out for the good of his people and the glory of his name. Now, I know people might be thinking, are you saying that God is, uh, is working evil for our good? Um, that, that God is actually using the evil uh, for the good of his children and that God's using evil in the sense that God then is doing evil things? Well, no, God is not evil, obviously. God does know wrong. He does not intentionally afflict his children in that way. Uh, but I will say this. We can either look at this one of two ways. Either God does not control what's happening right now, and these are just random occurrences, and God is, is uh, somehow bound and unable to help us, which is a terrible thought if you think about it. Or God is sovereign and in perfect, complete control, and this is part of his perfect and loving plan, and God is using this. We found that, we see that in, uh, all throughout the pages of Scripture when uh, Job was rebuked uh, by his wife, and uh, she said, just curse God and die. Uh, of course, you know, you know what Job uh, said. Job said, uh, shall we not receive, uh, or shall we receive good from the Lord and shall we not receive bad? And there is another passage in the book of Lamentations that comes to mind that uh, uh, says something uh, similar to that as it speaks about um, why we should not complain in the midst of hardships that we face. It says everything comes from the mouth of the Most High. It says um, uh, though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of man and uh, it says in verse 39 of Lamentations 3 why should a living man complain a man about the punishment of his sins let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven so there it is why complain why complain in the midst of this if we are so blessed. Well, my question from this point of guard your tongue is this. Uh, you know, we all would sing the children's hymn, he's got the whole world in his hands. Uh, we all love that song, but where the rubber meets the road is, do your words convey that message to the people around you? Are they able to see by what you say that there is a perfect and loving God who is orchestrating all these things for our good and His glory. Our tongues are so easy to get us into trouble. John Calvin said, there is nothing more slippery or loose as the tongue, and I would just say amen to that. There is nothing more slippery than this little booger right here. I mean, it is very easy for us just to let things come out uh, without slowing down. James chapter 3 warns us about just how slippery the tongue can be. It says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. And he says that we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they'll obey us, and he goes on to say, But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of of God. So he even says there that the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And so there we see the importance of guarding our tongue. And listen to this, brothers and sisters, friends in the Lord. If David had to wrestle with his tongue, and he was a man after God's own heart, to the point that he actually said that you know, he needs to put a muzzle over his mouth so that he doesn't say something that would actually offend God's children or would actually lead his, the wicked in his presence to, uh, to say, Aha! God isn't in control. God does love him. 
doesn't love him. If David had to say that, then surely we need to be careful to guard our tongue. So let's make a vow today. Let's vow that from now on, in any conversations about COVID-19, that we not say anything unless it's something positive about God's good providence in this. Let's vow with David to say, I'm going to put a muzzle on my mouth. I am going to, uh, I'm going to keep my mouth shut so that I'm not going to say anything unless it's something positive about the fact that God is in control, that God loves us, and that God is using this for his perfect purposes. One commentator, Dr. Morrison, has said, there are seasons when a good man must be blind to what he sees, deaf to what he hears, and mute when temptation to speak is peculiarly strong. Well, uh, this is one of those temptations. We also have to guard against uh, not just speaking harshly, but also speaking uh, quickly. Speaking too quickly when we should think first. You see what David did, and we uh, see that in verse 3, is David slowed down a little bit. He was tempted to say something that was just on, on the tip of his tongue. And if you actually, if you go back and read Psalm 37 and 38, and you can see what he was struggling with, it was the prosperity of the wicked and the affliction of God's children. And he was saying, what's, what's going on here? And so he was tempted to actually say something uh, negatively. And so what did he do? It says, uh, my heart became hot within me as I mused, which means to to ponder, to think over things. As I mused, the fire burned, then I spoke with my tongue. And we'll stop right there for right now. David mused. That means David held himself back. He pondered. He thought before he spoke. Now, we know in uh, Psalm chapter 73, verse 15, that, um, that David actually shares how he did speak and he did say something that was uh, not pleasing to the Lord. And it says in um, Psalm 73, verse 15, he says, If I had said I will speak thus, he's talking about the prosperity of the wicked and the affliction of God's children. He says, If I, if I, if I would have said, Oh, poor me, oh, God's children are just going through so much, why is it that the wicked are prospering? He said, if I will have spoke thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment. So what did David do? David says, I thought. I didn't speak. I thought first. Because if he had spoken, he would have condemned God and God's children. This leads us to our second truth. If we want to glorify God in this COVID-19 crisis, um, as I've said, first off, we've got to guard our tongues against saying anything uh, negatively about what God's doing right now. And uh, secondly, uh, we have to measure our days. So guard your tongue and then measure your days. Measure your days. He says there, verse 4, O oh Lord, make me know my end. And what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Make me know my end. We're not sure when this thing's going to end. We're not sure the end of COVID-19. But I can tell you, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that you will have an end. And that every single one of us will come to an end. And God knows exactly when that end will be. And so what God wants us to do is to ponder that, uh, to think about the fact that we will come to an end, uh, and it will come uh, not a few hundred years off in the future. It will come very, very soon for us. So William uh, Plummer, a uh, few hundred years ago, he records that when one very important man died in, uh, in his society, uh, someone said this who was there, at the funeral a pebble has fallen into a vast lake the surface is somewhat rippled but soon all will be as smooth as ever so think about that this this towering man everybody respected uh, this very important figure in society dies and as they reflect on this they realize you know what 
at the end of the day, man is nothing but a drop in this huge, vast lake, and the ripples are eventually just going to even right back out. And so we are so frail. We see that from the passage. Maybe you think, well, that's kind of depressing. No, I don't want to be depressed during this crisis. You know, I want to be encouraged. Well, let me tell you something. The most encouraging thing that you can ever have happen in your life is not only to know the Lord Jesus Christ, but even before that, and after having known him, is to know your end, to know that you will die, to know that you do not have very long in this world. You say, how in the world is that encouraging? Because that will do several things. There's five uh, very important and positive things that come out of uh, measuring your days. Number one, it humbles us. It humbles us. You know, it's crazy how uh, prideful we can be and uh, we think that we are so strong. Um, and yet, this situation right now with the sick and with the dying ought to humble us. It ought to make us realize, you know what, we are, we are very easy uh, to, be, uh, to die, to, to fall prey to these things. I mean, just consider how mighty and how powerful America is. And, uh, and yet, we are leading, as, you know, currently, as far as the number of sick and dying goes and I just thought about it uh, the other day you know all man's might and all of his power and all of his boasting look at how everything shuts down because of a microscopic virus huh that that goes to tell me that we are not as we think we are we will not live forever that we are not as powerful as we imagine ourselves to be so this microscopic virus can wipe us out as not only a nation but as an entire world so it humbles us secondly uh, when you measure your days it not only humbles you it exposes your trivial pursuits it exposes that you have been wasting time you've been wasting precious time that God has given you and that sand uh, or that um, hourglass with the sand of your life is there is a lot uh, less on top than there is on bottom and it is about to be emptied out so are you aware of that is that exposing how trivial things are in your life how you are spending time uh, maybe doing things that you shouldn't be doing maybe maybe even good things that are actually time wasters um, now I'm not saying you shouldn't get out and do some yard work in these days or you shouldn't you know, spend time with your family or any of that stuff. I'm saying, are there things that Jesus would not be pleased about with your time? And how can you uh, honor and glorify God with the time that you have? So that leads us to this, the third thing. It humbles us, it exposes our trivial pursuits, and it awakes within us a desire to serve or to work for the Lord. It, it, it gives you a desire to actually make your life worth something, to do something for King Jesus in this world. And then fourthly, it emboldens you to serve God. If you will stop and think about the fact that your life is very short-lived and that very soon you will die, what it does is it will help you to not be so worried or scared about what people think about you. Because uh, as uh, Richard Baxter said generations ago, he said uh, to a group of preachers, he said, uh, I, I encourage you to preach as, uh, is, as if you've never preached, you'll never preach again. Preach as if you'll never preach again and preach as a dying man to dying men. And what that means is uh, basically pour your heart into it. Realize that it doesn't matter what people think about you. What matters is what God thinks about you. And that goes for every Christian. Uh, we ought to live concerned first and foremost for God's glory. Not what people think about us. Not man's praise, but God's praise. So uh, we, uh, we see that it humbles us, it exposes our trivial pursuits, it awakes within us a uh, desire to work for God, and it emboldens us so that we're not scared uh, to serve God. And the last thing I was going to mention is that it helps us make the most of the time that we have. And I know some of those points seem very similar, uh, but there's little nuances, little differences to them. It helps us realize just how much time we actually have in this world. You know, 
he mentioned several different um, words to describe just how frail we are <laughs> in this passage. It says in verse 4 that we are fleeting. In verse 5 that we are a few hand breadths, and a hand breadth was, uh, was just your four fingers put together. That's about four inches. Um, he says uh, basically the smallest measurement that he could think of, a measurement that you have right there with you uh, all, every day, all day long. He says just constantly we should be reminded just how short and tiny a measurement is our lives. So it's fleeting. It's a few hand breaths. He says in verse 5 also that it's nothing. All mankind is as nothing. Uh, he says in verse 5 and 11 that we are a mere breath. Uh, he says that we are sojourners in verse 12 and guests also in verse 12. And uh, this passage just is right in line with um, James chapter 4, which says this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade to make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. All right, so this brings us to our last truth. Not only should we guard our tongues and should we measure our days, but we also must seek our God. So will you seek your God? Maybe you're listening to this um, and your hope is not in Jesus Christ. You have never uh, repented of your sins and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Yeah. Maybe you're convicted about the fact that you've been wasting your life. Uh, maybe it's uh, very blatant sins. Maybe it's just a lack of uh, loving Jesus and, and glorifying Him. Well, I would, I would call you to consider the fact that very soon uh, you are going to be called to the judgment seat. That Jesus is going to call you uh, to Himself and that there are only two places that you will go, either to heaven or to hell. And if your faith is not in the Lord Jesus, if your, your hope and your confidence in this life is in anything outside of Christ himself and what he has revealed in his word, in his death and his resurrection, if your hope is not in that, then friend, today you need to repent and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Very soon you will be launched into uh, the very presence of a holy God who has created the millions of stars in the galaxy, the billions of stars in the galaxy, and that you will stand before him. Are you prepared for that? Are you aware that this God has revealed himself to you and he has provided a means of salvation? You say, well, what is that? It's in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's in what Christ, who Christ is. He is a savior. He is the Lord of glory. He is the King of kings, Lord of lords. And it is in what He has done. He has gone to, uh, to the cross to pay the punishment, the penalty for our sins. And He has provided for us His perfect righteousness, which He will give to you if you will trust in Him today. So we have to seek our God. Now, of course, that's for uh, people who have not turned from their sins to trust in Christ. But... As a believer, we have to seek our God as well. And he says right there uh, in uh, verses 7 through 13, he goes on to say, And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? This is David's prayer. My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. And so David is asking for God to deliver him, to, uh, uh, to rescue him. And... Um, let me just say something here. Uh, in this day and time, it's very easy for us in this COVID-19 crisis to uh, look to other saviors, but God alone can deliver us. God is the one who has allowed this. This came through God's hands, and it has come upon this entire world. We don't know exactly what God's telling us, but we do know this. God's trying to remind us that very soon we're going to die, and that we ourselves are very weak and frail, and that we need to repent and trust in Him. And God's teaching us that we as His children need to uh, not waste our time, but to give ourselves to serving the Lord Jesus Christ while we still do have time in this life. But a lot of people are looking to other rescuers, other saviors. They're looking to vaccines. 
uh, or a vaccine that's going to come out, or they're looking to, um, you know, uh, social distancing tactics, uh, precautions, and that sort of a thing. Absolutely nothing is going to rescue uh, sinners except God Himself. Nothing can actually save us from this except the very one who is allowing it and who is sovereignly orchestrating it all. Uh, he is the only one. And so that's why David says, my hope is in you. It's not in anything else. What is your hope in? Is it in God? If it's in God, then this COVID-19 thing hasn't shaken your faith. Your faith has been grounded and people around you are going to be able to see, or maybe they have seen, that your faith is unmoved because your faith is in a God who is all-powerful. May that be the case for you. And then we see here that as David prays, notice what he says, I am mute. This is verse 9. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. There's God's good providence right there. David looks at this affliction. David says, you know what? I could say something negative about what's going on right now. I could complain. I could bemoan my circumstances. But he says, you, God, have done it. You have allowed this to happen right now. God is the one who has done everything that ever will be. And, of course, like I said, he's not the author of evil. And yet to think for a split second that he's not in control of all the things that go on, good, bad, indifferent, is, is not good. As R.C. Sproul has famously said, before he went on to be with the Lord, he said, there is no maverick molecule in this entire world. Now, he, he, he didn't live to see this COVID-19 crisis, but just that comment, there's no maverick molecule. There's no one little tiny virus that is getting away from God's hand and going out and wreaking havoc on this world. No, that's not happening. God is working it all for his good for, or for our good. So that's an encouragement for us as we think about this COVID-19 crisis. So seek your God. Will you seek him in prayer? David knew there is no refuge outside of him. David committed himself to seek his God. He said in verse 10, Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. He speaks about how God's hand is, is, like, a, um, is like a moth eating up uh, his clothing. And he says it just, it just wipes away secretly just wipes everything away uh, and that's also a picture of our life uh, Jesus actually says in Matthew chapter 6 he says do not store up treasures in this world where uh, where rust can destroy and where uh, moths can uh, can destroy and where thieves can break in and steal store up your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust uh, nor uh, thieves can destroy it and so he, he seeks his God. Are you seeking God? God hears our prayers. God cares about us. He says there, I'm a sojourner. I'm a guest like all my fathers. He said, I know that this is not my home. And that should be our attitude as well. And so, um, let's spend time reflecting uh, during this COVID-19 crisis on Psalm 39. Let's think about just how short our lives really are in this world. And let's use that to glorify God. Maybe there's a friend that you know that doesn't know Christ that's going through this and uh, maybe it's time to pick up the phone and call them up. Uh, maybe you've got some conversations you need to have with somebody in your family that you know you guys aren't on good terms. Um, realize that your time is short. Reach out to them. Uh, maybe you just you haven't been uh, living for Christ in the way that you've been spending your time. Uh, use this passage in Psalm 39 as a motivator to get you to uh, seek to live in a way that will glorify and honor God while you still have time. And then let's find something positive to say, even today. Find something positive to say about God's good hand in this to somebody around you. Maybe it can be your spouse, maybe it's uh, others. And commit that whenever somebody asks me, about COVID-19 or, or whatever's going on with this, then I'm going to say something positive about God. So uh, that's an encouragement for you guys. I pray and uh, trust that you will have a uh, good rest of your Lord's Day and a great week ahead. Um, just a reminder on Wednesday nights, you can join us for our Zoom meeting. 
Uh, we have that at uh, 630. And uh, if you want uh, to join in with that, then uh, uh, please let me know and I will share with you the, uh, the password to that meeting. So God bless you guys. Love y'all and uh, praying for y'all. I want to invite you just to pray uh, with me as we close. Our amazing and gracious covenant-keeping God, we thank you, God, that you are eternal in the heavens. Lord, that this crisis is not outside of your hands, but it is in your hands. God, that we are in your perfect hands, Father. Help us trust you. God, help us to be guarding our tongues this, uh, during this crisis so that we don't say something that would lead others to believe that our God is not in perfect loving control. Father, help us, God, to measure our days so that we don't waste our time in this world, so that we don't waste this coronavirus time. But God, that we would ponder your eternality and how awesome and eternal you are in our finiteness. And Father God, I pray uh, also, Lord, um, God, that you would help us to seek you. Help us to seek you in prayer. Help us not to seek uh, refuge in vaccines or in you know, a, a mask or any of that stuff. We know those things are helpful. We know those things are needed at times. But God, help us to find our refuge in you and you alone at this time. And we do pray that you would, uh, Lord, allow this virus to slow down. And God, just allow us to be able to return again as God's children uh, together so that we can give you all the glory and so that many will see that our faith has not been shaken, that our faith is in a God who cannot change give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. Pray your blessing on each and every one of us as we go this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. Y'all have a blessed Lord's Day.